in the beginning. But what happened in the beginning to bring about the earth, the universe, and indeed everything that we know and see? This question has mystified mankind from time eternal. Was there even a beginning at all? Has the universe always existed? Or is there any truth to the age-old account of the six days of creation found in the book of Genesis? It may come as a surprise to many, but did you know that the biblical six-day account of creation is more compatible with scientific findings than any other explanation for how the world began? For example, did you know that if, when analyzed from a scientific perspective, the created universe described in Genesis is the most structurally stable and mechanically efficient model of the universe ever conceived? Did you know that according to numerous passages of Scripture, the light God made on the first day of creation still exists today, and that this has been confirmed by recent astrophysical discoveries? Did you know that the water described as surrounding the whole Earth on the first day also still exists? and has been detected throughout various parts of the universe. Did you know that all geological evidence, when correctly interpreted, indicates that the Earth may only be thousands of years old, rather than the millions or billions assumed by most modern geologists? Were you aware that both the Genesis text and official Catholic Church doctrine have built-in prohibitions against evolution? and that rigorous genetic investigation has proven that Darwinian evolution is statistically impossible. Did you know that Sir Isaac Newton, for all his claims of finding proof that the Earth revolves around the Sun, admitted that the universe described in Genesis and other parts of Scripture in which the Sun and stars revolve around the Earth was, indeed, scientifically valid? Did you know that the popular astronomer, Edwin Hubble, realized the very same thing after looking through his telescope in the 1920s, but because he didn't like the divine implications of a central Earth, he devised the Big Bang model of the universe that has become the reigning theory today. And did you realize that Albert Einstein invented his famous theory of relativity in an attempt to discredit the many scientific proofs of his day that showed the Earth was motionless at the center of the cosmos? But did you know he later admitted the Earth can indeed be central and motionless in space? And finally, did you know that the Catholic Church has never issued any official pronouncements supporting either evolution, a moving Earth, or an old universe. Welcome to How the World Was Made in Six Days. The film you are about to watch is a groundbreaking effort to reconcile the modern conflict between science and religion unlike any that has come before. Our goal is to show how a literal interpretation of the six days of Genesis is supported by the authentic discoveries of modern science. Our goal is also to show that the competing theory, the Big Bang, is a scientific failure, a theory so riddled with problems, it's a wonder anyone still believes it. Today, Big Bang believers are desperately trying to prop up their model with all kinds of ad hoc fixes that are more dubious than the Big Bang itself. 
These fixes exist only in the mind of its believers, since no evidence for such remedies has ever been found, much less proven. And since modern cosmology is filled with such suspicious claims, we will also show how many false interpretations of Genesis from various religious groups have emerged as a result. Many claim, for example, that it is contradictory for Genesis to have a light that keeps the 24-hour rhythm on the first day, but have the sun, moon, and stars created three days later to keep the same 24-hour rhythm. We will show there is a logical answer to this apparent stumbling block that has, unfortunately, kept most theologians and scientists from embracing a literal interpretation of Genesis. As a result of this alleged contradiction in Genesis, some interpreters take liberties with the text by claiming the light of the first day could be what Big Bang enthusiasts believe occurred during a big explosive expansion 14 billion years ago. But Genesis won't allow such an interpretation for the simple reason that it says the earth was created before the light. Whereas the Big Bang insists the light was created before the earth about 8 billion years before. Therefore, in our analysis of Genesis, we have adopted as our uncompromising guide the literal interpretation that was taught by the Catholic Church Fathers, the medieval theologians, and the Catholic Magisterium for the greater part of Church history. As we appeal to the Fathers and the medievals, there is one caveat. Although they were in consensus on many issues concerning the creation narrative in Genesis, these same men sometimes had different views on the details. Over the centuries, the Church has not determined who was correct on these details, and has only made official decisions on some of the larger issues at stake, such as the fact that God created the universe out of nothing, and that God infused Adam with a human soul, among others. By the same token, although modern scientists all use the same instrumental and mathematical tools to gather and decipher the data they analyze, they have different interpretations, resulting in various models of the universe. What we have done in this documentary, then, is to take the best teachings of the fathers and medievals, the best conclusions from modern scientific experiments and theories, and the best interpretations of Scripture based on a thorough exegesis of the original Hebrew text. And we have put all these together to produce the most biblically sound and scientifically viable explanation of the origin and operation of the universe that we believe Christianity has to offer in the modern age. But more than relying on the best of mankind, we find it best to rely on the author of Genesis himself and take him at his word. The great St. Augustine once said, if anyone wishes to interpret in a literal sense everything written in this book, that is, to understand it only according to the letter of the text, and if in doing this he avoids blasphemy and explains everything in agreement with the Catholic faith, not only is he not to be discouraged, but he should be considered an outstanding interpreter worthy of great praise. This means that we must humbly place our trust in God as its author, since he makes no errors and does not lie and maintain that Genesis describes in factual, logical, and well-ordered sequence exactly how the world was created in six days. If one does not accept the words of Genesis in their literal meaning, he will consequently fall victim to a host of conflicting interpretations. For example, some believe Genesis is nothing but a myth or a legend the author borrowed from some previous culture. Some see Genesis as just ancient poetry built with a special literary framework such that days 4 to 6 are the same as days 1 to 3, just with more detail, and thus with no interest in the precise daily chronology Genesis presents. Others claim the historical detail of Genesis can be ignored because they do not deal directly with salvation, and are thus not inspired by the Holy Spirit but instead were written by unlearned men who had no understanding of the cosmos. Some believe Genesis was written in purely symbolic language or only conveys spiritual truths and therefore has little or nothing to do with actual historical events. In an attempt to meld Genesis with evolution, 
Some believe the days of Genesis represent millions of years and that Adam's ancestors were apes. And finally, some believe Genesis describes a world that consists of a flat earth with a hard dome, and they insist this same flat earth exists today. The reason we cannot support any of these interpretations is simple. Genesis does not teach any of them. As the early church taught us, Genesis teaches only what its literal words mean, nothing more, nothing less. Unfortunately, many Catholics today, because they have not heard a clear voice from today's magisterium, have accepted many unfounded interpretations of Genesis, which ends up leaving them open to the dubious speculations of modern science, such as the Big Bang Theory or the multiverse. Some might say our efforts are futile because religion and science have been at odds with each other since the time of Galileo. The truth is, true religion and true science can never be at odds. They are at odds only when false information from either the science side or the religion side, or both, enters the mix. Accordingly, we will discover that much of modern science, from evolution to the Big Bang to the multiverse, has been driven by an anti-religious bias, not by scientific facts. Truth be told, the popular image of the scientist in a white lab coat who is totally objective and never influenced by prestige or prejudice is nothing more than a myth. The sad truth is, much of science today is agenda-driven. This bias was no better admitted than by the late Richard Lewontin, a geneticist and evolutionist from Harvard University, who said, We take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. No matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. Moreover, that materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Lewontin is not alone. According to a recent study by Scientific American, 90% of popular scientists today are atheists, which means they interpret all the scientific evidence under the premise that God did not bring the creation into being and that God has nothing to do with its ongoing operation. Instead, most of them believe matter and energy have always existed or that they have the power to create themselves, which unfortunately means most scientists have lost touch with reality. But every once in a while, the truth is admitted by some of these scientists. Here is just one of many examples that we will cover in our series. One of the world's most renowned physicists, George F. R. Ellis, said the following in the prestigious magazine, Scientific American. People need to be aware that there is a range of models that could explain the observations. For instance, I can construct a spherical symmetrical universe with Earth at its center, and you cannot disprove it based on observations. You can only exclude it on philosophical grounds. In my view, there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. What I want to bring into the open is the fact that we are using philosophical criteria in choosing our models. A lot of cosmology tries to hide that. And in another interview, Ellis acknowledges that even the large, multi-billion light-year size of the universe assumed by most present-day cosmologists can be called into doubt. There's one possibility which you've probably come across, but I would want to mention here is the small universe hypothesis. <laughs> and this is the idea that, in fact, the universe is not very large in the following sense. It may be that the universe is spatially closed, not on a scale bigger than the horizon, but smaller than the horizon. Now, if that was true, we would be seeing around the universe one times, 10 times, 20 times since the time of decoupling. Now, to me, this is a very, very interesting possibility because Einstein's equations are large. The point is Einstein equations tell you about the differential behavior, the, the evolution. They don't tell you the topology of mm -hmm. the universe. And it's always been interesting to me, and in fact I did some simulations many years ago of this, this idea that maybe the universe is closed on a space scale smaller than the Hubble scale and we're seeing the same galaxies many times over. And that would be an example 
of a universe which is compatible with observations, but the philosophical relation of humanity to the universe is totally different. Here we have one of the most respected physicists in the world saying that not only can he use modern day physics to design the Earth-centered world of Genesis, he also says that he can use the same physics to show that the universe can be a fraction of the size modern cosmologists believe it is. He also admits that the popular models of the universe are not necessarily derived from scientific facts, but from philosophical convictions, which is precisely what Edwin Hubble did when he invented the Big Bang universe. Are you beginning to see that there may be more to the story of how the world was made than what you've been told? Then allow us to take you on a journey that you will never forget and one that could change the world as we know it.